The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. Amid optimism at a return to something like normality in the US and other art world centres, it's a big week in the New York sale rooms. So, has the auction market roared back to life and what have we learned from this week's sales? I'm joined by the art market expert Scott Rayburn to talk about the big sales and notable trends at Christie's and Sotheby's New York auctions this week. Meanwhile, as museums in England get ready to open for the first time in five months, we talk to Heather Philipson about her new exhibition in the Duveen Galleries at Tate Britain. And in this episode's Work of the Week, to mark the centenary of the birth of the German artist Joseph Beuys, I talk to the artist duo Heather Ackroyd and Dan Harvey about Beuys' seminal late work, 7,000 Oaks, and their response to it, Beuys' Acorns. Before we begin, a reminder that you can read the art newspaper anywhere, anytime with our iPhone and iPad app. Visit the App Store, search for the art newspaper, and then you can install the free app. If you're a subscriber, all the app content is available as part of your subscription. Now, it's been a major week of auctions in New York. Christie's held the first sales in two new formats. Gone are Impressionist and Modern and Post-War and Contemporary, replaced with the 21st Century Sale, which happened on Tuesday night, and the 20th Century Evening Sale, which was on Thursday. Meanwhile, Sotheby's did a three-pronged sale fest on Wednesday, with American Visionary, the collection of the late Texas-based collector and patron Anne Marion, followed immediately by a contemporary sale and their Impressionist and Modern Art auction. So what happened in the sale rooms? I spoke to Scott Rayburn, a contributor to the art newspaper and the New York Times. Note that we spoke on Thursday before Christie's 20th century evening sale, and I'll tell you more about that after the conversation with Scott. All the figures mentioned are in dollars, of course. Scott, before we start talking about the individual lots, let's talk about formats. Christie's has gone with a new style of category, which is 20th and 21st century sales. Sotheby's stuck with the old traditional categories how important is this does it make much difference well the thing is that the, the christie's when they announce this and it, it's clearly stated in, in the publicity they call it a new era in the art world uh, but the thing is back in 2015 we had a new era in the art world when they had their first 20 20th and 21st century we're looking forward to tomorrow and that back then in 2015 um made 706 million so actually, we are in a very different era of the art world, but it's uh, different in a very different way. Let's put it that way. Of course, we're now in a hybrid sale situation. And it was interesting, the contrast or lack of contrast in some instances between Christie's and Sotheby's. Christie's uh, have this hybrid format with a very, very swish auction room with lots and lots of screens with experts from all over the world. But Christie's, for all the money they've got to throw at this, the technology is still incredibly clunky. It's a bit like a game show with just a technical problem throughout. And uh, every lot takes five or six minutes. At times, the whole thing sort of froze. Um, There was a break of three or four minutes where you wondered whether your computer had broken down or whether there was something with the problem with the, with the sale. And it is quite remarkable, given that the, the huge amounts of money that are available to this company, that they can't sort out a slick technology for this, this sale, um, this format of sale. Uh, and I'm not alone in this criticism. It still feels very stiff and clunky. I'm sure they can sort it out, but compared to Sotheby's, which is far slicker in terms of its technology, and also Sotheby's has a far slicker auctioneer, Oli Barker is really quite a phenomenon. He's, he, he's absolutely brilliant uh, at churning these lots out in for hour after hour, creating a sense of energy in a format which is really, really dead. It is it is the most boring television in the world. You know, the, the weather <laughs> channel's more interesting. And it is a real problem for the auction houses, which we'll get back to. But Oli Barker in, in, injects, somehow injects energy, even though he's saying 45 million 30 times. Right. At Christie's, they need a, an auctioneer like that. The auctioneer, it was great to see a female auctioneer, that's, that's really good. But they need someone who can drive a sale um, because it, it matters a lot, even more than live sales, I think, matters a lot in this format. 
Right. And, and of course, Sotheby's was, did have a part live sale element, didn't <laughs> <It's fine>. it? <laughs> so so you, you've got the online element. And as you say, yeah. the, the idea is that I think going forward for some time now, it's going to be online and live. But actually, Christie's was exclusively online, whereas Sotheby's actually had people in the sale room. That's right. right. Uh, with, with Christie's, you had this amazing innovation of Microsoft creating a sort of virtual skybox, which we saw once or twice, and you saw some little heads in the background. Uh, at least with Sotheby's, you saw the back of about eight live heads uh, in the sale room. Uh, but what is going to happen going forward in the future is that it's now such a fixed format. I think there's no going back. And so you won't see a crowd of 300 people in the auction room. This, this is what's going to drive the auction, the, the, the top end auctions in the future. It might be a bit more like an Oscar ceremony where you'll get a few more people uh, on tables, perhaps invited guests. But I think this is going to be it going forward, I think. I may be completely wrong, but I can't see a, a return to a sort of 1950s style packed auction room. Now, in terms of the actual sales, I mean, both... Christie's and Sotheby's are obviously delighted. They have said so in their press releases. What's your impression? Are they are they right in hailing a new energy in the auction market after the pandemic? Uh, well, auction houses are always delighted after every sale, however badly they do. They, they always say that. The thing is that what is interesting, there is new energy in, in the market, but the market isn't on fire, uh, as one or two people have said. Where the energy is, is in this new group of, of how I've, I've characterised it, red chip artists. So young, often female, concerned with the issues of identity, race, gender. Now, even the older collectors are desperate to buy their works. And they're very difficult to obtain because there are long waiting lists. So when these works come up for auction, they fly. What's problematic, though, for the market, and I think it's going to be a real problem, is that the traditional blue chip artists, particularly the, the white, pale, male and stale artists, their values are declining, sometimes dramatically, but sometimes just ebbing away. And huge amounts of, of capital are invested in these artists. And it was interesting at this auction, there was example after example of people not being as interested as they were before. And the key to this was that and I noticed in both auctions that Asian bidders want the IRG, you know, Identity, Race, Gender, Hot Young Artists. They were lots and lots of bidding from Asia, which is very interesting culturally, but it may be a financial thing that they regard them as a better financial bet. But it was fascinating that Asian bidders generally had sort of given up on established white male artists and that that's pretty worrying for people who own this stuff and for the auction houses because it, it's asian bidding that just gives the froth it gives the, the chair and the icing of these results okay so let's talk about some individual lots so when the, the biggest numbers are basquiat so tell us about because there was there was a, there's a significant difference from the basquiat that sold for 90 million at christie's on tuesday and then and then the basquiat that sold from more or less the same period which sold for about 50 at, at Sotheby. So tell us about, you know, what do, what's your perception of that? Why is one Basquiat selling so much better than another? The, the key marker for this, of course, is the Basquiat skull that sold at Sotheby's in 2017. That sold for 110.5 million. Now, that was a sort of landmark price, over 100 million. We haven't had one of the, a single one of those during lockdown, which is significant. Now, the thing, the Christie's Basquiat was another skull. Similar format, similar scale, similar quality. There are only three of these things. So it's a triple-A trophy Basquiat. And that made, what, uh, over 90 million, didn't it? Yeah, including uh, 93.1. Yeah, yeah. You would have thought maybe if the market was growing, it would have been made over 100 million. But to be fair, it was estimated at 50. It did very well. It made 93.1. In terms of the, the Basquiat market, it's... It, it is actually quite simple that the two things that very, very rich collectors want are the skulls and the boxer paintings. The painting that came up at, at, at Sotheby's was a big monumental figure, but it didn't fall into that, either of those two trophy categories. And I think that that was quite a simple reason why it didn't fly. That's interesting. And, and let's talk about these red chip artists, as you call them. Yeah. Then. Because, like, for instance, there's there's one um, really major work. I knew this work 
um, I, I was amazed it wasn't already in a museum, actually, by Robert Colescott, which yeah. sold at Sotheby's, um, which absolutely smashed his record. But it's, sure. it's, a, it's a really powerful picture. It's a, it's, it's a version of the classic George Washington crossing the Delaware. It's, but it's George Washington Carver. So it's, a, it's a, a, a figure that emerged from slavery. It's a searing attack on caricatures of black people. It's, it, it, and, it's, and it's wonderfully, it has been bought by a museum. So tell us about that. I, I have not seen this painting. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I thought it was the best work of art in the entire week. It's very funny for a start It's in terms of its satire, uh, but its its irony is absolutely lacerating because, of course, you, you, you see this... One of the, the most famous images from American history and American art reimagined in terms of black Africans doing this. And then, of course, there's the extra level of irony, of course, that George Washington was a slave owner. So this reimagining of American history is what impressed me about the painting is that it really knocks you back and makes you think about American history and obviously slavery and and all the horrors that went went with it. But it's so witty and funny and it's very rare to, to look at a work like that and feel, my God, this should be in a museum. And of course, I gather it has ended up in a museum in the, in the George Lucas Museum of, of Narrative Art. But we look at the price, 15.3 million. But considering that actually it was the most, it's the outstanding work in the week. It should have made a lot more, really. But interesting, private collectors didn't seem to be as knocked out as people who had museums. The suspicion is that Alice Walton, again, technically a museum buyer, was the underbidder. It should have, it should have made more, I thought. It's aston- an astonishing picture. I, I agree with you. I, I, I've never seen it. Hopefully one day I'll see it because it's an absolute masterpiece. And then, of course, there were strong showings at, at both auctions for artists of colour um, from sure. both sides of the Atlantic, actually. So tell, tell us about some of those. Well, we had uh, Lynette Yodon Boacci, um, the painting Diplomacy, um, showing these rather stiff political figures uh again a, a good edge of wit and satire there. that made 1.95 million a record for the artist she's had several she's actually she's in an exhibition at the moment that's, that's right a tape britain yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah. retrospective at the moment and that always helps but again fascinatingly lots of asian bidding which in some ways you think well this is counterintuitive but no they they regard artists of color young female artists as where where they want to spend their money uh, at the very least and you had uh, Nina Chanel Abney at 990,000 Nicolaine Thomas at 1.8 million again all records yeah so there's enormous energy there so let's talk about that you said that there's sort of disappointing uh, results for what you what we would think of as sort of blue chip contemporaries or blue chip modern yeah. artists tell us about some of those well, I thought what was fascinating at, at Christie's, it's a, again, a new era in the art world. It was only until lot 17 that the first white male established art, a work by a white male established artist came on the block. And that was an Albert Olin abstract. And for the last two or three years, the, the, the market, the auction houses, and the, have been really trying to push Olin hard, in a sense, to replace Richter as a sort of prime German abstract painter. But this just went to one bid of 1.8 million it was guaranteed that was the beginning of certainly from my perspective of thinking well this is a bit of a problem for these white established artists there just isn't the same energy uh, of demand there and i noticed that for instance there was a Cy Twombly which i thought was a great Cy Twombly one of his blackboard works a marvelous work actually um but that went to one bid apparently a guarantor at at Sotheby's on Wednesday so it's it's consistent across those artists where the market was just exploding over the last decade. Utterly, utterly. I, I, you know, how do we characterise it? You could characterise it as hedge fund taste. It's from a different sort of financial era. And it was a beautiful, amazing painting. But of course, they've made double that in the past, the last five or six years, jumping around a bit. But there was a really telling example of this at Sotheby's with a Jeff Koons painting Pancakes from 2001. You know, this wasn't a Koons masterpiece. It was a fairly grim work, a sort of photoshopped food, feet and hands. Obviously, a lot of studio participation. Nonetheless, in 2007, this sold at auction for 3.8 million. Uh, This time round, it sold for 867,000. Now, you don't want to extrapolate too much from a single work, but it was a bit of a sign of the times. And also at Christie's, the previous night, 
we had unsold works by Christopher Wool and George Kondo. The Wool was, I think, at 6.5 and the Kondo at 1.5. They just bombed. Uh, and these have been the absolute bread and butter of the very top end of the contemporary art market. And it's a little bit concerning, I think. You mentioned that there's a lot of Asian collector interest in yeah. uh, in artists dealing with issues, um, particularly in the race and gender area. And then there's a lot of figurative art that, that isn't necessarily concerned with those issues that sold well this week. I noticed that, for instance, an Elizabeth Payton picture of David Bowie sold well. Sure, there's, sure, there's a sure. Dana Schutz uh, painting which sold well. Um, does that indicate a certain conservatism in the market in, in the sense that we've always sort of paintings as the most saleable of objects and so it, it, in in a way it's a safe bet for collectors at this moment as well well there are two things here um firstly i don't think we can infer that asian bidders spending a lot of money on works by younger artists who are interested in in issues of of, of gender or identity and race implies that they want to grapple with these issues uh, they may want to make a lot of money out of it to be fair, I don't know what the motivations of the individuals who buy these things. It would be great if more and more collectors are taking these issues seriously and it's informing their taste. And I hope it does. But often people just want to make money. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. In terms of figurative art, I, I think it's just easier. It's decorative. Take that Twombly, for example. That's that's quite a rarefied and tough picture. It's beautiful and it's very brilliant in the idea. It's based on graffiti from ancient Roman buildings, which is beautiful, but it's quite cerebral and, and it's grey. It's not red, you know, that, that, that's the other thing. Who wants a grey picture? Because all the furniture is going to be grey as well. So you want a bit of colour on the wall. Well, well, that was actually really <laughs> highlighted in the fact that a Rishta in the in the Christie cell, which was, I think, sort of greys and, and cooler colours. Greens, yeah. Did, did performed pretty badly. But then a Rishta in so at Sotheby's on Wednesday did much better and it was red. That, that's right. And, and they, and, Well, it's, it's one of the great cliches of the art where any picture with red in it does well. But it's particularly true with, with Richter. Uh, but again, it was pretty worrying that... Christie's, they let a, a Richter abstract sell way, way below estimate. Um, and again, he, you know, he's one of the ultimate blue, traditional blue chip artists, and the demand wasn't there. But the, the, although there was the, the the demand there for one with quite a bit of red in it, indeed. So you know, in terms of where we're at, obviously there will be a demand to say the market's roaring back to life after pandemic. It sounds to me like you're saying there are qualifications. Yes, there have been some good things, but it's but we, we cannot say, hooray, art market's all healthy again. No, absolutely. Going back to, you know, that simple thing, 2015, 35 lots at Christie's and their 20, 21st century sale, 706 million. Um, Christie's contemporary sale. Now, admittedly, you have to add... Now with a new format, you have you've got the twenty first century and the twentieth century, but the contemporary sale just had two hundred and ten million. It's a, it's a different world, but you do have tremendous concentration of of energy and interest in these younger artists. That the the problem with it is is how sustainable. Uh, one thing I I, I noticed um, retrospect after the sales were over is what happened to cause. There were no cause lots in these sales. And course was the the hottest thing in the market, and has a Brooklyn museum show. And as you said earlier on, you know, if an artist's got a museum show, then yeah. it does tend to help. So, not a not a single cause work. It's just a, it seems to be not over, but obviously the really intense competition has gone. I think we have to be slightly concerned about this intense demand for these new names if it's being supported by very speculative bidding in Asia, because it just can sort of ebb away quite quickly. Right. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. But the thing is that that a million or two for these new red chip artists seem impressive compared to their estimates. But it's not forty, sixty, eighty million, which is what the the art market was used to in two thousand and fifteen. We've had Sotheby's Impressionist and Modern Art sale. Any highlights about that? There was, of course, a Monet and there was a Cezanne too, right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, the thing is that that. As we all know, in recent years, the emphasis in the market has shifted to contemporary and impressions and modernists has been regarded as a, a, a slightly unfashionable, poorer relation. But there are certain works that still are regarded by trophies who collect contemporary works, 
Monet's water lilies, of course, uh, are a great example. And uh, Sotheby's had a Bassin aux Nymphaeus painting in their, in their Imps and Mods sale. And when these come up, the auction houses go on and on about Jackson Pollock and how he influenced the abstract expressionists, and we know that connection, and so on, so on and so forth. So it's the, it's the what probably the one thing in the in precious and modern market that that has real crossover potential. It was a big picture this Basson Nemphias produced at the same time as he was producing the great cycles in in the orangery. This work was in the, had been on loan in the Kimball Museum. But what was interesting about it was that it had never been exhibited. And in the catalogue, it said, bears a signature. It didn't say signed. And when you look in the bottom corner, there's a Claude Monet stamp down there, oh. which is very different from a signature. And it's one of these works because it was an extraordinary period of Monet's life. And he was pro- working on this incredible project. And he produced lots and lots of paintings, uh, not all of which he liked or finished and then when he died there was a bunch of stuff left in the studio this is a picture that was from the bunch of stuff but interestingly the auctioneer Oli Parker said well it reminds us it's just like the works in the orangery no it's a very very different thing indeed it was unsigned it bore a stamp signature uh, but it that was fudged in Sotheby's cataloging but anyway the image was strong enough and it made 70.4 million Again, it didn't make over 100 million, but it made a strong price. Compare that to there was a Cezanne Still Life or Fruit, a really beautiful painting. Stunning thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. 18, 18, 90. A little bit small, that's one thing against it. Um, and it sold underestimate for 20 million. Now, back in 2003, it had sold for 8.7 million, which was then a much stronger price when you account inflation. So that was an interesting comparison. You had this this Monet, which is a great name, great image. For the connoisseur, there are problems about it because it's not quite what we, we, we think it is. And then a jewel like Cezanne, but in the current market, it's, it's, it's not a sought after. But that was an interesting comparison. I suppose there is a big test, and obviously we can't talk about this because we're talking before this happens, but there's a Christie's 20th century sale which happens uh, on Thursday evening. Yeah. And, and in that you have a Monet Waterloo Bridge, which is another sort of iconic series, yeah. if we're you exactly. know, using that word. And then and then also, obviously, this Picasso Maritores. And so uh, there will be another two kind of very, very well-established markets to compare to the past, right? And, and the Maritores is going to be interesting because that corpus of work has probably been the most successful among the 20th century works at auction for the last, I don't know, five or six years. But there are problems when you delve into the sort of what drove that corpus in terms of, you know, Picasso and Marie Therese, that slightly problematic relationship in, in the context of current morality. And it'll be interesting to see if the the energy slightly ebbs out of that market, given the current cultural climate, I would say. Um, because Picasso's personal life is not quite as admirable as, as the art, maybe. We haven't talked about NFTs. There was a landmark NFT work in a, the Christie sale. Obviously, we had the Beeple work, which sold earlier this year for a huge amount of money. How, how did it compare to that? Is it comparable? It's such, an, it's such a unique market to a certain extent, the NFT market, right? The crypto punks were a, a pretty fascinating inclusion uh, because unlike the, the Beeple NFT, the crypto punks actually are algorithm generated. So they are created by computers. And People who know about these things regard them as a sort of war hall of NFTs. They're very important art historically, actually, although they seem quite sort of slight and trivial. But in terms of NFT art history, they, together with the wonderful Crypto Kitties, are the sort of uh, Giotto and Chimabue of NFTs. So it, this was an important moment, including NFTs in an analogue art sale. But I actually thought Christie's really missed a trick because the really rare CryptoPunks are aliens. I forget how many there are of them, maybe nine or something like that. But this is, this is what the, 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 the serious CryptoPunk collector wants. And these have sold for up to about seven and a half million. But they offer these CryptoPunks as a job lot um, with the alien in it. 
No, I know it made a, a, a tremendous price. It made 17 million, uh, which seems fantastic. But it's a meaningless price because you can't compare it to anything because you have to divide it. They should have offered the alien as a single lot, I think. And maybe they were nervous of doing it. I, I don't, do not know why they didn't offer the alien at, say, 5 million. And that would have created a meaningful result. But offering a job lot, I don't really think did anyone a great service. And what about this idea that the Banksy at Sotheby's was as able to be bought with cryptocurrency? Do you think that had any effect on the fact that it well overperformed its, its high estimate? So as soon as you offer a work in crypto, um, you are going to hopefully suck in Ether money. And people are making so much money out of Ether, it's going to inflate the price. So we had the, we had the Banksy, which was a, a, you know, a pretty generic stenciled flower thrower. Uh, nice enough, you know, iconic work, blah, blah, blah. But it made 12.9 million. And I'm sure at least two or three of the bidders had big bloated crypto wallets. But there was quite a lot of Asian bidding. You think about Singapore, which is the centre of a lot of crypto activity, and that would have helped. And you wonder, well, if that does it to a Banksy, why not sell the whole sale in crypto? Let's go really crazy. Is this oh, but they're probably having dis- they're probably having discussions about it now, um, and it will probably add, double the, the the total of the sales. We probably need a pretty stiff drink after it, but you know it's it's. <laughs> What's to stop it, this madness? On that note, Scott, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ben. And as promised, the results of Thursday evening's 20th century sale at Christie's. Scott's interest in whether present day moralities may affect the market for Picasso's portraits of Mary Therese Walter proved unfounded. The top lot of Christie's sale, Picasso's Famasies Près d'une Fenêtre, Mary Therese, sold with fees for more than $103 million, with bids from six bidders. That's close to the record for a Mary Therese Walter Picasso. That's held by a nude green leaves and bust, which sold for more than $106 million at Christie's in 2010. Interestingly, a far more troubling and less serene portrait of the great surrealist photographer Dora Maar by Picasso sold well within its estimate at just over 17 million at Christie's. The Monet Waterloo Bridge that we mentioned sold for 48 million 450,000, a record for a London Monet. And just as the contemporary sales saw records tumbling for artists of colour and contemporary figurative painters, so the 20th century and the impressionist and modern sales this week have seen records being smashed for women artists. So self-portrait with a scorpion by Leonor Feeney, the surrealist artist who we've talked about on this podcast, had an estimate of six. 600,000 to 800,000 and sold for more than 2.3 million at Sotheby's on Wednesday and then at Christie's on Thursday and Alice Neal Interior with the same estimate sold for more than 3 million. A Barbara Hepworth with an estimate of 2.5 to 3.25 million sold for more than 7 million and there were also impressive sales for a Lee Krasner Abstract at 7.23 million, two Joan Mitchells for 12.3 million and 6.6 million and a beautiful Agnes Martin for more than 4 million. You can follow all our reporting on the New York sales at theartnewspaper.com or on the app. Still to come, we talk to Heather Phillipson about her Tate Britain commission and to another Heather, Heather Ackroyd, and her collaborator Dan Harvey about Joseph Boyce. But first, here are some of the top stories on the Art Newspaper's website this week. The artist Lawrence Abu Hamdan, one of the four artists who shared the Turner Prize in 2019, turned over his Instagram account this week to a fellow artist, Inas Halabi, as she reported live from Haifa on the continued police crackdowns on protesters in the Jewish Arab city. As Annie Shaw reports, nightly demonstrations have been taking place after hundreds of Palestinians were injured when Israeli forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem on Monday, firing tear gas and rubber bullets at worshippers. This is after wider protests have focused on the threat and forced eviction of dozens of Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem. On Monday, the violence escalated when Hamas fired more than 200 rockets at Israel and Israel responded with strikes by fighter jets. At the time of recording, at least 87 Palestinians and seven Israelis have been killed. 
one of the most famous hill chalk figures in England, the 180 foot tall Cern Abbas giant in West Dorset, has been dated for the first time to the late Saxon period, as Maeve Kennedy reports. The results of the year long study overturns earlier suggestions that the figure was prehistoric or even done in the 17th century. The research by scientists working with National Trust archaeologists used optically stimulated luminescence, or OSL, on grains of sand from the deepest layer of the sediment, which can reveal when they were last exposed to sunlight. It suggests a date of between 700 and 1100 CE, though the enclosure above the giant, known as the Trendle or the Giant's Frying Pan, is almost certainly far older, the remains of an Iron Age hill fort. And finally, as Christina Ruiz writes, one of the five artist collectives shortlisted by Tate for this year's Turner Prize has condemned the institution for exploiting black artists and artists of colour. Though Black Obsidian Sound System, or BOSS, acknowledges that it's grateful to have been shortlisted for the prize and for the recognition of their work as a collective, its statement noted the, quote, exploitative practices, end quote, underpinning the Turner Prize and prize culture in general. They also accuse Tate of failing to support artists whose work it displays, condemn the museum's handling of sexual harassment accusations against one of its most important patrons, Anthony Doffe, as well as its response to strikes organised last year by Tate staff, whose jobs were cut because of the pandemic. You can read these stories and much more on theartnewspaper.com or on the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This month, Christie's London hosts The Collector, a sales series bringing together the finest European and English furniture, sculpture, ceramics, silver and gold boxes from the 17th to the 19th century. Presented over two sessions, the live sale on the 19th of May showcases works of art with distinctive craftsmanship and provenance. The corresponding online sale is open for bidding until the 20th of May and offers a broad range of objets d'art, furniture, porcelain, glass and silver, perfect for those wanting to curate a unique interior and with a particular emphasis emphasis on dining. Visit Christie's London for the Collector Exhibition until the 18th of May or explore works virtually on christies.com via an online viewing room curated by the fashion insider Peter Copping, former artistic director of Oscar de la Renta. Welcome back. A reminder that you can catch up on all the episodes of our sister podcast, A Brush With, featuring in-depth conversation with some of the great artists of our time, including Judy Meritu, Rachel White-Reed and Rashid Johnson. You can listen and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you're listening now. Now, England's museums finally open on Monday the 17th of May, after five months' closure. Among the many mouth-watering shows is a new commission in Tate Britain's Duveen Galleries by Heather Phillipson, whose work is also on view on the fourth plinth in London's Trafalgar Square. Our contemporary art correspondent, Louisa Buck, went to Tate Britain to meet Heather. Fingers all knotted when Tate Britain opens on Monday, May the 17th. At last, we will be able to see Heather Phillipson's fantastic commission for the Duveens, which we are now standing in at this moment. I'm here with Heather. They're putting the final touches on the installation, so we'll hear a few bits of working around. We hear this fantastic ambient noise. It's got the best title ever, Rupture Number One, Blowtorching the Bitten Peach. And a peach does make an appearance, but I'm not saying where or when. And the whole of the Duveens has just been inhabited by this incredible sound, vision. There's a giant silo, there's drums for oil and fuel that have been turned into sort of giant cows with horns that are digging into a, a paddling pool full of what looks like oil. There are strange insects that have been made through recycled bits of corrugated iron and metal hovering in the air. There's a whole forest of different video screens parked on a kind of raft of sand and and salt um, showing individual animals' eyes. And we're standing underneath this kind of amazing figure, this giant creature that's been made, that looms through one of the archways. It's been made entirely out of sheets of media and, and newspaper pages covered in that. So it really is sound vision extravaganza. The walls have got these great billowing clouds of dark, strange, orange, apocalyptic smoke in one part of the Duveens, in another part it's blue, cloudy, and then there's also great big screens with birds flying through the air. I could go on, I won't, because I'm going to talk to the artist now, but it really is an amazing eyeful. Heather, what an extraordinary experience. What an amazing feeling of the Duveens. Tell us about it. What's going on here? Well... Firstly, it's important to say that what is going on is impossible to summarise. I mean, whenever I approach a show or a new piece of work, it tends to start with some kind of atmosphere or feeling, a tone to which then images gradually become attached. 
So when I was invited to make a commission for this space, it was very much starting from a tonal palette, you know, thinking about what is the specific kind of dosage of light and sound and the particular kind of feeling that I want to engender in the space or across the three spaces. And from there, things started to accumulate. And I've described it in terms of a series of maladaptive seasons. So, I mean, I'm personally fascinated by weather, especially UK weather forecasts and these descriptions of the way that weather blows in and um, disrupts everything in its path. And I guess I want the galleries to operate a little bit in that in that way so that they start to become alive um, and that they're a kind of uh, a system, a dynamic system, you know, that as somebody entering in the space, you operate within that dynamic system. It's not something that really can be predicted in advance, but that it's something that unfolds in relationship to you and you in, un- in relationship to it as you pass through it. You're taken very much through a journey here. I mean, we enter at the main entrance end with these these screens of these animal eyes and this great big figure at the end that straddles the arch. And then we look through into these chunks of machinery that has been repurposed to form some strange animals. There is a kind of end of the world feeling here, a sort of apocalyptic feeling. Even this great big creature we're standing under under its legs, it's got all these bits of newspapers stuck to it that have sort of blown. One feels like it is the, the end of an era. It's the, there's a very apocalyptic feel to this particular setting, I think. I mean, for me, yes, there is that, but I think there's also something that conflicts with it as well, that perhaps I've described it as pre-post-historic, that there's maybe, I suppose, A, when I'm conceiving of something like this, there is uh, a drive towards perhaps making a sense of a place that is not like any other place you've ever been in. But perhaps more accurately, something like a different epoch. So maybe you're entering into a different kind of time zone as well. And it asks you to invite people who come in to kind of readjust their senses accordingly. You know, that there's a sort of perceptual shift that you have to undertake when you come in. That isn't about like the end of this world or the world that we're in, but is some kind of uh, parallel time zone or timescape, landscape that is operating across a radically different kind of time in a way and place and that there's always an aspiration to make it feel like one is uh, entering some kind of alien environment Um, so that those terms become kind of hard to transpose from the world outside of the gallery into this one. They they sort of become irrelevant to some extent. I mean, new life forms have evolved. You know, these, these large drums that dip their pipes into this central pool of oil have horns. There's hovering in the air these insect creatures that have been made out of bits of recycled corrugated iron and metal. So one almost feels like out of the sort of wreckage, the entropy of some previous era, these new life forms are emerging. And it does seem to be very much an environmental message. I'm not saying you're doing direct, you know, green polemic here, but there does seem to be very much a sense of engaging with the natural world, the sort of blighted natural world and what can come out and how nature just keeps on trucking whatever we do to it. I mean, one thing in here is there's maybe a gesture towards perhaps the the supreme indifference of other creatures towards us and an absolute dwarfing of us as human figures within this landscape so a kind of heightening of how small we always are and have been and will be and how that's kind of thrown into relief through some of these characters that appear in here and again just to go back to that sense of wanting to make something that feels alive that perhaps there's a kind of agency that the things within this space have that is not of us or that is beyond us that we can't control that there's like a different kind of force that's at work in here yeah, so we, we're part of this system, we're also apart from this system. Exactly. We have a kind of unclear status as we walk through. Yeah. Now, this was meant to open a year ago, and then, of course, COVID happened, and the whole thing was put on hold, and now you're, you're reopening it. Have you changed or adjusted the installation at all for COVID? Or did you feel you needed to? I haven't adjusted it conceptually at all. I think I felt pretty strongly. I reflected on it for a moment, you know, because, of course, there was a, you know, a period of time immediately after the first lockdown when everything was so uncertain and it was hard to envisage what it might even mean to be back in a gallery at that point. But having reflected, I decided that actually everything that I was thinking about the idea wasn't a, you know, a brief, a momentary passing idea. It was something that was very deep inside me that I needed to explore by manifesting it physically, and that hadn't changed. 
so I felt very committed to continuing. Of course, with the changing context around the gallery, then perhaps things will be seen differently. But my hope is that once you're inside this space, the space has its own logical system that maybe relates to that outside world, but it's actually you're entering something that's of its own nature, I suppose, to use that word in inverted commas. So the only concessions that I made really were to, I guess, you know, there were certain things that had to happen due to visitor access and the routes through the space. Um, and, you know, obviously keeping, making sure that there was enough distance for people to pass by each other in terms of the COVID regulations. Um, but other than that, no, it's, it's as it was always intended to be. And just the context around it, I guess, will shed different kinds of light on what is happening inside. I mean, you're, you're no slouch at, at large spaces. You did that extraordinary piece, um, Netty McEggsy Rub, in Gloucester Road Tube Station, which occupied you know, the whole of a tube station with, with all different kinds of media and works. A kind of apotheosis of egg, that one was. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, of course, your, your piece on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, the end, which is still very much there, the amazing pile of cream, the cherry, the fly, the drone. I mean, so dramatic and, and eye-catching. And then the, the Baltic as well. I mean, yeah. but nonetheless, this space is very demanding. It's very big. It's very processional. I mean, what sort of challenges did it pose for you? How did you, how did you kind of go about tackling it? How did you think about it? Well, first, I, I am always interested in doing things in spaces that are scary, that, uh, that I find a bit daunting. For me, that's where the excitement happens, really. You know, the, the challenge of trying to figure out how to work with that space, you know, or at least to take that space into account, you know, definitely in the Davines. And as people will know from previous commissions, the architecture cannot be ignored. You know, as soon as you enter into this space, you're in a dialogue with the architecture. It's not a cube that you can make disappear somehow. Um, so even though I've covered quite a lot of the space, I've also worked very directly with it. The fact that it is this sequence of spaces, the fact that it has these kind of leaky sides going out of it, um, the, the columns, the kind of neoclassical, the grand neoclassical architecture, wanting to kind of take on that, the sort of vastness of it. And Trafalgar Square and Gloucester Road were similar but different, you know, as in there's a context, is they're both very loaded, you're taking on that particular cultural context. So in Gloucester Road, the context of it being somewhere that people are passing through as they're on their way to somewhere else, Trafalgar Square the same in a way, but also, you know, it's a very politically loaded site surrounded by military monuments. So in every case, you know, for me, the artwork is made partly by what it's surrounded by, you know, that those things couldn't necessarily just exist somewhere else. They're in a conversation with that, A, by default, but B, by my volition as well, you know, that I want to take those things into account. There's also the fact that each of these spaces has its particular and unique challenges in terms of the technicalities of actually installing in them, which lends a completely different aspect to uh, the work, you know, that really can't be foreseen, which is, you know, in terms of what's allowed materially, how you access the building, whether it's, you know, like in Trafalgar Square, you had to get planning permission. Um, Gloucester Road, of course, there are, you know, multiple fire regulations. In here, it's a listed building. So all of these things that feed into the genesis of the work as well and what's permissible materially, these things all, you know, add a particular character to how I can operate within the space, which can be more or less useful, you know, they're having those parameters in place. And the end is, of course, there it is, in Trafalgar Square, overlapping for quite a substantial time that this piece is also extant. I mean, did you think about the two having a conversation? Are there connections between the two? Yes, so I was aware the fourth plinth had already been commissioned by the time I was offered to do the work in here. So yes, they were always going to overlap, even despite COVID, there would have been an overlap. And so I think I was thinking, and also the Baltic show as well, which was called The Age of Love and was like a huge... Um, again, it was full of sort of references to other forms of creaturely life, which also is the same with the plinth to some extent with the fly. And the drone. Of exactly, course, and the drone and, and the kind of this relationship between uh, other forms of creatures and technology, you know, which is, which is carried across all of those shows. So there are some kind of thematic and visual parallels between all of them and Gloucester Road too. But I guess, you know, thinking of the end is a very uh, abrupt and direct title. 
Um, whereas this enables something much more expansive, you know, that there is not that I necessarily think of the work, the end as being uh, like a definitive denouement to something. It could be also the opening of something else. But this is very much, you know, my work is so much about movement and the passage through space. And I think of it very much in terms of musical composition, actually. So to go back to what I said at the beginning about tone and setting tonalities, to think of that musically, you know, like that I might be working not with notes, but with uh, colours, sounds, to build up a kind of musical palette that unfolds as you progress through it. So, you know, that you know that there's like a sort of a linear progression to some extent, but that also it can go off in multiple different directions simultaneously. And I was able to do that to some extent with the plinth because you can move around it. It's a sculpture, so there are different points that you can access at different times. But on in here, it's and especially because the other thing since COVID is that you have to come through kind of front to back, that there can be this specific progression. So it's through. a journey, basically. You take people on a journey now through the space in a way that actually if they'd been coming at it from all angles in the past would have been very different. Exactly, yeah. So I was able to control very directly how in what order you'd encounter things as you move through the space. So to have that sort of like, as I think of it, musical kind of adventure of one thing unfolding after the next and a sudden key change or a shift of tone and then what then gets revealed or the, the different counterpoints that might be operating at the same time. I mean, you've, you've, you're trained as a classical musician, you've worked as a DJ, you also write poetry as well. So you have many different kinds of entry points into this piece and many different disciplines coming to bear. I mean, it seems like this is they're all very important, the way they feed into what we're standing in now. Absolutely. These things, you know, all of these things inform my thinking. And even though, you know, there may not be, say, over language in here, um, there may not be music overtly, but they're in there you know implicitly because I can't separate those things out in my head so even having like a very fundamental awareness of the structural palette of those art forms you know so what I draw on in terms of how I think about music or what I've you know my education in music or my education in uh, writing which you know is also a self-education but uh, how those things have informed everything about the way my brain functions, then, of course, that gets transmitted into whatever comes out in the physical forms as well. And huge collaboration. I mean, you've had scene painters making the side drops, the construction of this great big beastie that we're standing underneath now. You know, you work with a, a large team of people to get this done, as indeed as indeed in, in, on the plinth, as indeed all your other work. It's, yeah. You know, the actual sort of dirt under the fingernails making isn't so important for you, though, of course, every single nuance of appearance, I imagine, is very carefully orchestrated by you and absolutely how you want it to be. Thank you for mentioning that, because this is something that's really important to me, is, of course, it's my name that's on the door when you enter, but... The team efforts that have gone into realising this project are absolutely phenomenal. Um, as you say, Louisa, we've had uh, scenic painters, fabricators, lighting designers, uh, AV technicians, uh, obviously all of the Tate art handlers, you know, the curators. It's, a, it's an enormous job and uh, a massive team effort. But yeah, of course, for me, it's like I have to be aware of every single detail simultaneously, like keeping an eye on exactly that just making sure that everything is realized and at something this scale it's really hard to you know be on top of everything but that's the that's the challenge and of course there are the moments where I've been you know so the videos I make entirely on my own all the audio I make entirely on my own so I am sort of all over it even though you know maybe I haven't been sort of up to my elbows in the scenic paint it's uh yeah that's where the collaboration really happens, you know, is that everybody's been really all over their part of it and then it comes together. And then at the end of the run, all these parts, I mean, a lot of them have been recycled already. We've got the agricultural machinery, the great big silo at the end, the tin baths flying through the air, the piles of tyres that are seeping all sorts of weird gunk. And it's all recyclable and going to kind of vanish back into whence it came. That's the hope. I mean, I'm... Intellectually, I'm more drawn to uh, the impermanent than the permanent. So it suits me that this thing will 
cease to exist and hopefully go on to have other lives elsewhere, the bits of it. And like you say, I'm interested in the fact that a lot of these objects are already very loaded because they've got the patina, they've got the marks of they've their history. Their past, yeah, yeah and that you see that, you know, you feel or you feel it, you know, that there's a sense of these things coming from elsewhere and congregating here momentarily before they, yeah, return to whatever scrap heap or, you know, the next person that might use them to make something else again. And of course, I'll keep what I can, but space being what it is in London, that's probably not going to be a lot. People coming in here who may not know you and your work into this extraordinary environment full of all these different sounds and changing light and strange, quasi-recognisable creatures, some more than others, what, what do you want them to think? Is there a message or is it a kind of sense of just immersing themselves in the environment? What, what, what are you communicating to a, a completely off-the-street audience here i never try to second guess what is going to be thought or felt in one of my spaces or alongside one of my works it's completely open to whatever happens and you know i think it's completely unpredictable how anybody of course we all bring our own personal experiences and histories to these things and our persuasions and political positions and that's that's where the dynamism of the system happens that people come in and they will have a completely different experience of it to how I experience it myself I mean there is this of course to pick up on something you just said I'm very interested in the fact that the potential of things in the world for one thing to resemble another and that's always there in the work you know utilizing that capacity of materials or objects to always resemble something else but within that this capacity for sort of metaphor or for people to decide what that other thing is that it resembles is completely open you know that I start sort of putting things in place but it's a dynamic system and those things continue to kind of go out in different directions but there is nonetheless to my mind a great sense of dynamism and energy yes it does have a feeling of you know potential change and you know, detritus and debris, but rather like in Trafalgar Square as well. There's a sort of sense of celebration, a sort of sense of exuberance that runs along with this sort of bittersweet end of the world, but also beginnings of new worlds, perhaps. I mean, I do feel there's an underlying sense of optimistic energy. Is that me being fanciful? Excited about seeing art in real life again? (laughs) I mean, definitely I'm excited about seeing art in real life again. Ideally something that's not my own art at this point. But I think... You know, fundamental to all my work is some idea of conflict, you know, that one can hold those seemingly contradictory positions simultaneously so that one can feel apocalyptic and optimistic at the same time, you know, that perhaps within the world those things are already operating and, you know, it depends what you choose to pay attention to and what you choose to pay attention to then grows as you pay attention to it, you know, and that perhaps there are moments where it feels more apocalyptic in here and moments where it feels joyful and that those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive but can coexist. Apocalyptic and optimistic, I think that's a very good note on which to end. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you, Louisa. Rupture number one, blowtorching the bitten peach, is at Tate Britain until the 23rd of January 2022. And Heather's work, The End, is on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square until the spring of 2022. We'll have more on museum shows opening in England in next week's podcast. And finally this week, it's the centenary of the birth of Joseph Beuys, the hugely influential German artist and teacher who died in 1986. His premature death meant that he never saw the completion of arguably his most important work, 7,000 Oaks, a project he began at the Documenta exhibition in Kassel in Germany in 1982 to plant 7,000 oak trees alongside basalt blocks in the city. The work was completed exactly a year after his death. In 2007, the artist duo Ackroyd and Harvey collected and germinated acorns from the oaks that boys planted for their project Boys Acorns. It's appeared in various iterations since, the latest being on the south terrace of Tate Modern, revealing that those acorns have now grown into trees a couple of metres high. I spoke to Heather Ackroyd and Dan Harvey about Boys and his enduring environmental message. Heather and Dan, let's start by talking about Boyce's 7,000 Oaks. Heather, what was so significant about that project? It was a project that really came into focus for us around 2006, 2007. 
And it was very much around conversations with artists, with scientists as well, um, around whether or not art has an influence or a play into the political sphere. And it just occurred to us, and I was, we were hearing many artists saying that they felt that art just did not have that ability to really, to really make impact within the political and economic world. And I kept thinking, but Joseph Boyce actually was already talking about um, interrelating socio-ecological, all the forces um, present in society. He was one of the co-founders of the German Green Party, which is a a very effective and influential, probably a world-leading, environmentally-based political party. So that was the start. So then beginning to sort of register the scale of the work of 7,000 Oaks, if you've even just sort of planted a few trees and, you know, trying to stay behind a few trees and ensure that they, they have, you know, that they, they survive and that they thrive, 7,000. So it all came together around 2006 in our thinking. Dan, Boyce's project really was extraordinary wasn't it it literally was the the planting of 7000 oaks in castle in germany and, and and the scale of that endeavor and the kind of the collaborative requirements for such an endeavor it, it's it's relatively unmatched i'd say in in terms of these kind of big social artworks wouldn't you say yeah, I mean, certainly so. I mean, unfortunately, Joseph Boyce didn't live to actually see the planting of all the trees and the last tree was planted by his son. But I, I think the whole intervention, too, of the community getting involved with planting the trees, the setting of the basalt markers that mark the trees and things. And I think that that wish to actually withdraw from the gallery scene and to do something within the city and, and make the city more forest-like. Yeah, and also, uh, Heather, it was th- there's this remarkable thing, which again is so prescient in terms of, you know, that in order to command the space for these trees, he, he, he kind of invaded spaces that were meant for cars, car parks, etc. And this idea, you know, in, in, there he was in 1982 saying, the car must become more redundant. We must cease our reliance on cars. It seems to me extraordinary that, it, it, you know, we're talking, you know, 40 years ago, Boyce was saying these things. Yeah, I mean, just so ahead of time, he and his collaborators, you know, I, I think as well, you know, the the German Green Party was also partially born out of the strength of the feminist movement of that sense, you know, also coming out of the 60s into the 70s as well. And that sense of, you know, people power, you know, really starting to emerge from the kind of the clutches of the Second World War. And, you know, I just feel there was a huge for us there's just a huge generosity in what he is doing but he was being radical and he was challenging he was challenging the city he was challenging um you know the bureaucrats and the city planners to sort of say we need to open up spaces we have to bring these living presences and entities into our city they have to be part of our neighborhoods in a really really fundamentally implicit and integrated way and you know i like that i like the fact that he was that he, that he was challenging that and sort of planting trees in places that most planners would not accept. And and, and, and there was a, a deliberately, incredibly provocative gesture really at the early stages of the project, wasn't there? Because right there in the heart of Castle, uh, Dan, there were, there, were, there were these basalt blocks piled up in this kind of sort of ocean of basalt blocks, right? It, right outside the major spaces there for the for documentary in 1982. I, I think that that was, I mean, they, they were locally sourced basalt blocks, but they are enormous, but they, they go back into the deep history. And I think just seeing that pile of them there and realising that each one of those was going to be linked to a living tree that will go on, you know, hopefully for hundreds of years. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think, you know, it was, it was certainly a statement and visually uh, incredibly powerful. And what's lovely with uh, the Boyce's Acorn show at the Tate at the moment with our trees above the oil tanks, there are basalt marker stones from his end of the 20th century artwork in the old oil tank below. So there's this sort of feeling of above and below. That's lovely. Let's talk about Boyce Acorn. So tell me about how, how you went about doing this. You actually went to Castle and you took acorns from these trees tell me about that process Heather. The idea actually came about really really 
quite quickly. And actually, at the time, Dan was up in the high Arctic um, uh, with Cape Farewell. And I was here and catching a train down to Castle to collect acorns. But during the summer, we had visited um, some, some friends in Tuscany in Italy. And as we were departing, she gave us two gifts. One was the man who planted trees by the French author Jean Genot. And she gave us a handful of acorns from her oak trees. And on the train, going back up to the north of Italy, where we have family who we stay with, while I was reading the book, and we were just really, really caught by what was said. The book is such a powerful fable. But what really, really caught attention was his daughter explaining how her father was given this commission by the Reader's Digest in America. And he created a story, submitted his draft to then hear from Reader's Digest that actually uh, we wanted this to be about a real person. You know, they, they, did, <laughs> they deduced that his main character was not real. And um, this, this sort of manuscript, his story sat, you know, on the shelf until he was approached by a German publishing house in, in the 70s, asking them if he had any thing he'd like to publish and he thought oh I've got this I've got this story so he um he you know he bought it down and sent it off to them and they loved it and they said we'll publish it and I just thought that's it reading this book on the train reading that story from Jean Genot's daughter you know Dan and I were just talking and thinking this could be the inspiration for Joseph Boys to go and start 7,000 Oaks and then so so Dan you went to Castle was it a totally self-generated thing or was it for an exhibition that you went to you went to actually get these acorns to and is it right you took 200 from Castle I think we came back or Heather came back with more or less uh, 700 and the idea was and and still is that it's a very open project we weren't thinking right we'll grow these for this particular show and I, I don't think you could ever really talk about and plan the, the, the end of something like, like this. You're growing trees that have a potential of living for hundreds of years. I mean, they're, they're 17 years old now, and some we've lost. We actually lost an awful lot within the first year. We had them in a friend's garden, because we actually don't have much land here. We have an allotment, but or we had an allotment, but we kept them in a, a friend's garden, and they had trees at the back of their garden, with squirrels in <laughs> and after about three weeks we realized that there were these little hollows in so many of the pots at the back of the garden and they were <laughs> helping themselves to a free lunch so you know, squirrels have rights too I suppose <laughs> but um, so yeah the, the idea um, certainly was that it would be an, an ongoing project and we would allow it to grow and develop and they were always sort of a, a catalyst for conversations and research and that's the way they've continued to be. But I think we're beginning to think that sooner or later we're going to have to find permanent homes, certainly for some of them, and start to plant them out. I mean, one of the things, Heather, that, that Boyce said about this was he, it, it wasn't just this very concrete artwork. It was also a symbolic gesture, and he hoped that people would take that gesture as a sort of marker and, and reproduce it elsewhere in the world. And do you feel in a way that you are continuing Boyce's project with your own? I think the invitation was to, pe you know, I mean, he worked with um, people in the community, with volunteers, with students, you know, people, you know, throughout the city to to plant 7000 trees. It's just just thinking about <laughs> even getting permissions, you know, and uh, all the bureaucracy that you have to go through. But I think he did something that was just so profoundly important and visionary. And also, I think, just the, the quiet power of Jean Genot's fable, The Man Who Planted Trees, has also created a huge swathe across the globe of informal tree planting. And this is a very important part of nurture, the nurture of nature. Through that quiet custodianship, that sort of guardian gardening presence that people have you know or to commemorate a particularly important event in their lives the birth of a child the death of somebody you know important to them I think Boyce Joseph in a way he just caught that whole kind of stream of thinking and also after the first world war we know in this country in the UK parks and forests were, were devastated so that the timber could go to the first world war 
But in the Second World War, there was equally a huge toll on trees, on nature as well. And, you know, I think all of these recovery, the necessary recovery after, you know, after the, um, after the atrocities of the Second World War, it was kind of moving through that as well about bringing life bringing this this agency of these amazing trees and the life they support, you know, back into the city. But he declared the whole world should be a big forest. Indeed. Um, Dan, I, I first saw the Boys Acorns project when they were really saplings. This was at the Royal Academy a few years ago uh, in, a, in a show which was themed around, around climate change. Now, of course, they've grown, as you say, and to, to the extent that you you now have to be thinking quite quite immediately about how they how they can be placed. It, it suggests, therefore, that while it has a contemporary manifestation now at the Tate, it was at the Bloomberg site in London not long ago. It suggests that this is this will sort of continue through your artistic life in a way. Is that how you see it? I, I think very very much so. It as a project has a, its own life force that will continue uh, throughout our lives, but also. Uh, after after we've gone, after we passed on, it does speak to that urgency, doesn't it? I mean, I mean, apart from anything else, while it is an ongoing project, there are key points, and I can see, you know, Heather behind her right now has a culture declares emergency poster. You know, you are at the heart of this movement, which is which is forcing the art world to confront climate change in the way that Boyce was doing in 1982, and it, and 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 even with things like air pollution, we know that children are living in London at the moment who are suffering hugely from the, the effects of air pollution, and trees obviously have. A massive effect on that. So this project, in a sense, it never loses its urgency, does it, Heather? It, well, it doesn't. You know, and in fact, the urgency year by year just cranks up. I mean, we were talking um, at the Royal Academy, um, which that exhibition was in 2009, and that was coinciding with COP15 in Copenhagen, the big global United Nations-led conference of all parties on climate change. And, you know, we were aware of then how many billions of tons were being pumped into the atmosphere and i think the urgency is we we really have by culture declaring emergency it's a declaration of climate and ecological emergency and i think the ecology the environment the degradation of the biosphere and habitats really needs a huge amount of attention and regeneration but in terms of declaring that happened there was a core group it's a very collective from across the arts on the day we launched um, in April the 3rd 2019 it was a hundred people who actually brought that into being so it was a fantastic mainly on zoom we did a lot on zoom so we were already pretty proficient in zoom behavior before we went into the pandemic because of the activism (laughs) but Think this, that within the year of declaring, culture declares emergency, we're in lockdown. We have gone into lockdown and suddenly this pause, this quietness that descends all across our lives and and a kind of being perplexed and also for many people suddenly reconciling the seriousness of what was happening and the urgency is to, is also to recognize that these zoonotic diseases is because of the continual degradation and incursions and cutting down of forests and places, not just forests, but places, other habitats, be they peat bogs that are drained. And this continual kind of attack on these spaces is pushing creatures further into suburbs it's denying them space to 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 behave within their natural behaviors and then of course the co-opting of of creatures and putting into markets and stuff so the this is where we have to really 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 be looking i think is what what is happening how do we begin to really start to do incredibly joined up really really collective work in the way we've seen with the vaccine, which has been such an extraordinary global effort. How do we begin to do that around really regenerating our wild places, but also city and town spaces and rural spaces? For for us, this is where we place urgency, emergence in emergency. 
Well, we're talking about museums declaring climate emergencies and so on. I just wanted to ask you about the fact that there is this ongoing debate around funding and particularly the fact that the British Museum has a show um, about Emperor Nero coming up, which is sponsored by BP. And the Science Museum, for instance, has a show which is due to be sponsored by Shell, which is actually about climate change. So I just wonder what you make of all that. It is this sort of greening over of their their industries that I find really disturbing. But even if they are shifting to carbon neutral ways of producing energy, it's not about continuing the way we have been used to living. We need to fundamentally change the system. And that needs to come about through a respect for nature and returning to realise that We are part of nature and nature isn't here just for us to take from and to to use, that we actually need to find that balance again with the natural world. There will be comment and there will be a creative response and that may be left if culture declares emergency to, to do through their own agency, through their own activism, creative activism. And, you know, there are other conversations that Culture Declares Emergency is having with Culture Unstained, for example, which did this incredible piece, the Trojan horse that happened at the British Museum last year, which was really, really effective. We do not have any luxury of time. The buffer disappeared 15 years ago. When we were hearing the climate scientists such as John Chanel Nehuber, who at the time was the director of the Potsdam Institute in Germany, he could put across urgency and seriousness with beautiful lightness of touch with a great joke but he absolutely pinned us all with the fact we are running out of time and that was in 2005. Heather and Dan thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah thank you very much. Voices Acorns is on the South Terrace of Tate Modern until the 14th of November. And that's all for this episode. You can subscribe to the art newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. Click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so. And please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Henrietta Benfield and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Scott, Louisa, the two Heathers and Dan. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.